Hi everyone, Sam Jones from Ground Control Sector Lead for Housing. Uh, I'm delighted to be here with David March, Environmental Sustainability Lead for Orbit Group. And following CIH in Manchester in September, uh, David and I thought it would be a good idea to, to get together um, post COP26 just to discuss some of the highlights um, and potentially lowlights from, 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 uh, from the conference. Um, and, and particularly a couple of points of interest to us both. So first of all, David, welcome. Do you want to give yourself an introduction? Thank you, Sam. I think these uh, these videos are a great idea. So very, very keen to, to have this conversation with you. Uh, I am David March. I'm the Head of Environmental Sustainability for Orbit, a mid-sized housing association based in the, uh, the Midlands. Um, we uh, operate a environmental programme called Orbit Earth, um, covering climate change, biodiversity and resource efficiency. And I'm sure I'll draw on some of those themes in this conversation. Great. Thanks, David. So first of all, uh, I wanted to focus around some of the commitments around green energy that came out of COP26. Uh, certainly one of the, the main focus points for, for, for a lot of uh, interested stakeholders and nations and particularly around the commitment to, to a green energy infrastructure and and that the, the signatories to, to, to COP26 um, all agreeing by 2030 to have significant green energy infrastructure going out through their organisations. Some positive and negative thoughts around that, I think. Um, uh, most of all, is it achievable, but also the impacts of that shift change. Um, and I know uh, to yourself and to your, to your end customers, David, that um, energy and, and, and change in use of energy has both current and future implications. Um, particularly around what that might do to, to, to their wallets. So I just wanted to, to ask, you know, what is it that Orbit Group and yourselves as an organisation have any uh, in, interesting insights to that and some of the things you might be doing to help with mitigating it? Uh, yes, um, well, green energy is uh, going to be the future for all of us, isn't it? And so any commitment to accelerate that is uh, a very good thing. I think we're all largely aware now that most renewable technologies, uh, solar, wind, are actually cheaper than their fossil fuel equivalents. So it is all about rolling this out as fast as possible and the funding mechanisms that will support us in doing that. Orbit already has hundreds of solar systems on our properties and we have, uh, I believe, over 400 heat pumps as well, which are another form of renewable energy. Um, but we do need to do uh, much more. The recent spike in gas prices it has been a massive example of why we do need to act faster. At the moment, our customers are exposed to wholesale gas prices globally. And with increasing populations, increasing middle classes in countries all around the world, we are in a more and more competitive market for that gas. So we do need to move to another technology. And I suppose that's one of the um, both good and bad things from COP and from the government's net zero carbon strategy and heat and building strategies released just before is we kind of got some good news in this area, but we didn't get everything that we wanted. There's still a question mark over hydrogen. Will that be a, uh, you know, a, a get out clause or do we need to go full on into air source heat pumps or other low carbon heating technologies? It does seem the government have committed more and more to heat pumps but we still don't know exactly how that's going to be funded. Short term supply chains just can't meet the demand, even of the Social Housing Decarbonisation Fund. Um, and we've seen prices go up for the, uh, the installation of those quite a lot in recent uh, in recent months. Um, so I'll, I'll, um, what's, what else can I say here? I think I think I'll hand over to you at that point, Sam. It, it's you can tell I'm still digesting some yeah. of the some of the implications there. Yeah, no, I agree. And one one thing I'd like to pick up on what you said was that um, more needs to be done quickly, right? Mm. Uh, and it's not just on on governments to to do that. And it's clear that Orbit Group are doing great things around this. Um, but it's not just organisations that are uh, embedded in energy infrastructure that could do more to help this ground control. For example, whilst we uh, the, the core of our business is around uh, green space management and creating and maintaining uh, attractive and sustainable environments. We also recognise the power of investing and supporting these kind of projects and infrastructure. Our Evergreen Fund, for example, which uh, ring fences 5% of our net profits on an annual basis, uh, is set up purely to invest into green infrastructure and green seed or, uh, 
projects. Uh, over the last two years, we've invested over a million pounds into to green energy and infrastructure projects, some with varying degrees of success. But the reality is that the business and, and the organisation remains focused on supporting these infrastructure and green projects. So the highlight for me is that the, the organisations, regardless to what it is that your core of your business is, should be looking to support uh, uh, in this green shift uh, and this, this shift towards better climate change management as an organisation, regardless to what the core of your business is. So I think from my perspective, COP26 should be relevant to everyone um, and, and not just just a few that have focus into energy as, as one of their, their, their dimensions of their organisation. Um, that said, I would like to draw things to something a bit closer to home. Uh, one of the biggest uh, discussion points and uh, success points from our point of view around COP26 was the commitments towards deforestation. And um, with over 14 million pounds now pledged to making uh, zero net uh, deforestation a thing by 2030, uh, with 85% of the world's forests covered under that through the organisation signed up to it, um, I think it was a really positive outcome from COP26. And ground control understand the, the importance of trees and forests to, to, to the to the planet and the success of climate control. Um, so much so that we work with uh, over 3000 customers over 45 uh, 55,000 customer sites where we have the privilege of being essentially custodians of, of trees and forests and the management. So we're in a, in a privileged position to help make this a realisation. But it's not just on our customers. And one thing that we realise is not just on the customers and the influence we have with the customers to make the decisions around good tree management and forest management. It's 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 our own actions on our own pledges. So ground control now have a a, a commitment by 2025 20, uh, to plant a million trees across the UK. Uh, we are well uh, beyond our, our run rate on target on achieving that. Uh, so much so we are reconsidering that as a as as a as a ceiling number. But the reality is that investments from our business, part of the Evergreen Fund investments, go into uh, uh, funding this so that this this has a positive impact and we've been doing this with housing associations as well um, and I know it's something that housing associations have a focus on because it's becoming an increasingly uh, important thing for, for uh, housing providers to incorporate into their sustainability planning. I know it's something that is happening uh, even currently with, with Orbit Group so it's something you want to uh, elaborate on David around that point that'd be great. Yeah, certainly, Sam. I mean, you know, I've I've had the privilege of working with Evergreen in the past in a previous role, and I really think it's a fantastic opportunity. I, I don't think we contributed much towards the million trees, maybe a couple of thousand, if I remember. But uh, you know, every little every little helps. Um, so one thing I didn't mention earlier, um, which perhaps I should have done, was that Orbit did release during uh, COP26 our net zero carbon commitments. Um, so we have set out a clear goal to be net zero carbon in our direct operations by 2030 and in our supply chain and housing by 2050. Now that is not true zero carbon, right? We are going to need to do some kind of carbon offsetting from 2030 onwards for our own buildings and fleet and from 2050 to cover our housing and our supply chain as well. And I think that's where we can really link into some of the biodiversity and tree planting work that we're doing at Orbit. So today, and the same day that we're recording this, we are planting over 250 trees at one of our new build estates. I knew you'd like that, Sam. <laughs> um, and we are currently, I believe, later this week, running uh, Thursday this week, piloting our first biodiversity enhancement at one of our existing estates. The idea of these pilots is to dig up tarmac. You know, we have these large tarmac slabs and courtyards and things on these estates across many of our social housing developments and replace them with green spaces so that might be flower beds. It could be taking the lawns and just mowing them less frequently, replacing some of them with wildflowers, having more diverse shrubbery forming hedgerows. So nothing that is going to fundamentally change uh, a customer's use of a space, something we often can't do with the tenancy agreements anyway, but things that will hopefully improve the well-being of our customers by making the areas just greener, more enjoyable, but also I believe there'll be some longer term advantages of this, certainly when we think about the impacts of climate change, which is is already happening, but is going to continue happening. Um, you know, removing some of that tarmac, having soil, having plants that absorb rainwater 
is going to reduce surface water flooding, for example, one thing that we expect to see more of in the years to come as a result of climate change. At the same time, greener, darker surfaces like that are better at uh, casting shade and reducing the heat island effect, whereas black tarmac is not great for that. And if we are talking about you know, global warming and particularly in the summer months, anything we can do to reduce that is going to reduce the need potentially in the future for cooling. Something we still don't talk about too much at the moment. Uh, we're talking about making homes better insulated, giving ventilation. But, you know, a few days every summer, it's already getting quite hot in, in my home, you know, um, and we've got a lot of elderly or other vulnerable customers in social housing. So what this is all developing into is a biodiversity strategy for our business. We're looking to align with the 30 percent uh, managed for nature target, which has been set out internationally and seeing how that applies to social housing. Um, we have some fantastic GIS data, and so we're sure that we'll be providing more on that in the near future uh, through the Green Spaces Advisory Board. Great. And David, you picked up on a, on a really uh, pertinent point there, uh, well two actually, one that biodiversity is equally as important as as, as forestry management in, in our goals to climate change. But uh, equally is the, the the introduction, kindly segue to uh, the Green Spaces Advisory Board and uh, a note to, to everyone watching this. There's a lot to come from that. It's a fantastic initiative where myself uh, and David and, and six other housing providers are coming together to, to really put some meat on the bones around some of the, the challenges that we face as organisations and some, some outcomes and some shared learnings and best practices as a result. So more to follow on that. Uh, in the interim, it just leaves me to say thank you, David, for, 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 for joining me and sharing your thoughts around this. Uh, a, a congratulations on your recent award for uh, becoming a, an Unlock Net Zero Climate Change um, Powerless Champion. So congratulations on that as a massive accolade <laughs> and look forward to catching up again in the near future. You too, Sam. You take care. Thanks, David.